Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new episode of Stories from Space Podcast, where your host, Matthew Williams, examines the history of human spaceflight, the breakthroughs that revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in it, and the brave individuals who work tirelessly to advance the frontiers of our understanding. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. The authors acknowledge that this podcast was recorded on the traditional unceded lands of the Lekwungen peoples. I was really young when the Apollo missions took place, but I do remember sitting in my living room with my family and watching Apollo 11 land on the moon. And I think that's something that just has stuck with me my entire life. And so I've always been interested in space exploration. I remember as a kid in school, whenever we'd get the weekly reader, a little newspaper of science and news from around the country. And so whenever we would get something in there that had a picture from you know, one of the the early Mars missions or uh, later on Voyager, I would just be enamored with it. So this has been a lifelong interest of mine. In all my reporting that I've done since, uh, I guess I started in 1999, it's, that's really what I've enjoyed the most is getting to interview people who do behind the scenes things, make these missions happen and do things that normally don't make the press releases or, uh, or the front, front page news, but still yeah. make incredible contributions to the missions. Hello all, welcome back to Stories from Space. Joining me today is a person that I'm proud to call a colleague. She is a fellow science communicator and something of a mentor, mentoring figure to me. Uh, she was there when I first joined Universe Today, and she's also a noted author who has two uh, rather, rather famous uh, titles there, which include Incredible Stories from Space and Eight Years to the Moon, The History of the Apollo Missions. Welcome, everyone, to Nancy Atkinson. Nancy, thank you for coming on. Hey, thanks so much for asking me on, Matt. It's great to join you on this yeah. new venture of yours. <laughs> well, thank you. And <laughs> and I got to tell you, uh, I, I was real concerned uh, that uh, given the title of your first book, Incredible Stories from Space, that, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> I was having one of those moments where I'm like, oh, God, am I going to get sued here? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not by me, anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't worry Good about point. that. Yeah, good point. The, the the series is young. <laughs> Lawsuits could be, you know, something uh, far down the road when, you know, people actually start to notice. But yes, I also wanted to say, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that your books and, well, one of the key things that I've, uh, that I want to do with this show that I've, uh, and that I certainly said so when, uh, during the, the introduction to it, which uh, was, uh, part of an episode of uh, audio signals uh, here on ITSB magazine. Yes. So that one of the goals here was to look at the personal side or the human side of things and, and tell stories of how major research, major discoveries and important missions, how they happened. And I feel like, yeah, you and what you do embodies that like, very, very well. So yeah, I consider having you on here uh, a perfect example of yeah what she is doing that's that's what i want to do too she's done it first and she's done it more so well thanks yeah i've i've uh in all my reporting that i've done since uh i guess i started in 1999 it's that's really what i've enjoyed the most is getting to interview people who do behind the scenes things make these missions happen and do things that normally don't make the press releases or uh, or the front front page news, but still yeah. make incredible contributions to the missions. Absolutely, yeah. In your two very very famous and influential books, certainly within uh, the space community and the wider science uh, communicator uh, community, you you tackled the stories behind the stories first with uh, incredible stories from space, which was released in two thousand sixteen. 
And you looked at several well-known space missions uh, of the time, New Horizons, Curiosity, Hubble, and told the stories of the, uh, the lesser heard, the unsung uh, people behind these robotic missions. And then eight years to the moon, the Apollo missions, right? Basically, uh, yeah, I felt like uh, eight years to the moon was what you did in, uh, in your first book there, but vastly amplified because, of course, these missions were such a big screaming deal at the time and, and still are to this day, right? And yeah, I certainly that certainly resonated with me there. But first, before we get into that, I want to ask about um, how you came to science communication. For example, I know from uh, your your dossier here, you started writing at University Today in 2004, 10 years before I joined, and you've since become a writer for the Planetary Society, the National Space Society. I'm just a, uh, I'm just a, a feature writer uh, for, for the Planetary Society. I write, right. uh, now, uh, I used to write you know, the, the articles for their website, but now I'm r- primarily writing for their magazine, which is a quarterly magazine. Yeah, and also for uh, the National Space Society's publication uh, at yep, Astra. I write occasionally for them at Astra, and mm-hmm. you know, like they they need they've got a lot of writers, but uh, whenever they need a, a feature article there too, I'm available. And also just started writing recently for Supercluster, which is an online site, and um, they they cover all sorts of things, every everything to do with with space. And this, of course, has led, uh, yeah, to you becoming a person who gathers these stories behind the scenes uh, from space. Now, could you tell us a little bit about how how it all started for you? What sure. drew you to it? Yeah, well, um, I was really young when the Apollo missions took place, but I do remember sitting in my living room with my family and watching Apollo 11 land on the moon. And I think that's something that just has stuck with me my entire life. And so I've always been interested in space exploration. I remember as a kid in school, whenever we'd get in Canada, do you have the weekly reader when you were a kid? No. Uh, anyway, no, it was sure. it was like a it was like a weekly little newspaper of of uh, science and news from from uh, from around the country. And so whenever we would get something in there that had a picture from, you know, one of the the early Mars missions or uh, later on Voyager, I would just be enamored with it. So this has been a a lifelong interest of mine. Um, But I did go to college to be uh, to be a writer, kind of. I I majored in English with a emphasis in mass communications, but I didn't really know what I wanted to write or, you know, I didn't, uh, I tried writing fiction that really didn't sit well with me or it didn't just, it didn't turn my crank as people like to say. And so when I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. All I knew was that I did not want to teach. So of course I ended up teaching, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I taught at a really cool place, the Science Museum of Minnesota. And um, there I had the chance to do a lot of hands-on science things with students and also had the chance to um, create a program for they had they had access to a one third actual size inflatable space shuttle, and they needed a, a program for that. And so I developed the program and did all these hands on space science things, and really kind of got my juices flowing again as far as my interest in space exploration. And from there, I uh, I kind of realized that I wanted to reach a broader audience than just uh, just uh, grade school kids. And so I started just writing and uh, had the chance to write for a very young space.com. Uh, did a couple articles for them and also um, wrote some articles for kind of the local newspapers. And uh, I lived, live in Minnesota. And so they, one of the astronauts that went on one of the, the space shuttle missions was from Minnesota. And so I pitched an article to the local newspaper and they said, sure, go ahead, interview him. And so I ended up doing three articles uh, based on his mission. So that gave me a good start. And then um, uh, in 2004, I, uh, I saw a note on Universe Today that Fraser was looking for 
writers. He was basically doing it all by himself. And so I, you know, pitched him a, an idea or said, you know, I've had some articles published. And so he, he gave me a, a really great assignment for my per- first article and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so now I'm, uh, I've kind of got a goal here. I'm closing in on 6,000 articles that I've published for Universe Today. So uh, that's, that's coming up. I hope to get that done by, before the end of the year. That's excellent. You, as you, you said in your first book, Incredible Stories from Space, from 2010 onwards, you, were, you began to witness missions, right? You would, you would go down to NASA's Kennedy Space Center, you'd see missions happen, you'd talk to people behind the scenes, and yeah, and, and from that, you, you, got, uh, you were privy to a lot of uh, an insider's look, really, that, that few people get to have. Um, and one thing I, I thought was, uh, very interesting. I mean, you, you explained in, uh, in, in your book that, uh, yeah, there is a rigorous process for getting robotic missions approved and you, you walked, you walk the readers through that. And, um, and also how there, there's a quote there, the, where you said, uh, these machines are, are emissaries out into the cosmos flung to far away places that humans can't yet visit. And I thought that's really quite, uh, really quite meaningful. Um, so a question that came to my mind was, do you think that there's, when, it's, uh, when it comes to robotic missions versus crewed missions, uh, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, that robotic missions are, are, are less valued? Uh, they, they don't quite get the same uh, amount of credit that they deserve? Well, in some aspects, perhaps, I think the, general public really is, you know, enamored with human missions, at least they have been in the past, the Apollo missions really captured a lot of attention. Um, But also take a look at the excitement of the images that come back from the Hubble Space Telescope and how much that has changed uh, the general public's perception of space exploration or of space itself. And the images from the, the Mars rovers, the you know, kind of human eye level pictures taken from these rovers and, and landers that really give us a, a human perspective of what, a, what it would be like to stand there on Mars surface. So I think um, while there is a lot of interest in human missions, uh, you know, the robotic missions really, again, to take us to places that we can't go. And so that that really offers something different than what human missions can do, at, le- at least at this point anyway. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's all these people making it happen. And yeah, there's often uh, funny or inspiring, I'd say always inspiring, sometimes funny stories as to how they got it done, right? <laughs> right. Oh, exactly. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of, uh, I've, yeah, in my first book, there's a lot of uh, stories that I feel kind of privileged to tell or things that they shared with me that, you know, had, hadn't made it to uh, prime time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, now, as I mentioned, yeah, you, you covered some of the just the most uh, uh, renowned and game changing missions that have happened there um, in the uh, past 10 years or as of the uh, now, as of the book's publication it was missions that, that had launched from 2010 onwards. So uh, or or were still active in that time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that included New Horizons, Curiosity, Hubble, the Dawn mission, Kepler Space Telescope, the Cassini Hugens mission, a Solar Dynamics Observatory, Mars Reconnaissance or- Orbiter, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. These are all, these were all very game changing missions there. And I, uh, myself, there have only really been following these since uh, 2014 when I, when I started working with the, uh, Fraser and the uh, universe today. So like immediately I, I, I thought, Oh yes, these, all of these missions here, there was so much uh, that they revealed. So it did, it, it, it struck me as just how interesting these, uh, you know, what was going on in the background there to make that happen, how that uh, was just so very, very interesting in itself. Um, now of all the, 
these missions and all the the people behind it there um are there any stories that uh that you picked up along the way that still just <laughs> jump out at you it's like oh yeah uh there's there are a couple and uh, one of them involves the the new horizons mission that flew past pluto and i got kind of an inside look at well i got to vi- uh, visit the mission operations center out in baltimore at john hopkins uh, university and it was interesting. I didn't get to be there the day of the of the historic flyby in 2015, and um, but I remember watching the video feed, and that room was just absolutely packed with with people from the mission. A few um, photographers, uh, most of the reporters were in another room, but the day that I was there, it was just me and uh, and one other person who was showing me around, and so that was that was really special to be there in this kind of quiet room where I could see the data coming in and, and that kind of thing. So that was really fun. Uh, But in the book, I got to tell the story. I don't know if you remember Matt of seeing that first image of Pluto come back that had the kind of famous image now of Pluto with the heart shaped area in the, in the center of the image. And um, so I got to hear the story of how that image came back and what the people, the first people who saw, saw it with human eyes, their reaction and when what happened. There was a bit of a funny story where uh, uh, the person that was supposed to be monitoring the, the data coming back, uh, he, was, he kept clicking on his computer to refresh the screen to, to get the data to come in. And then he realized he was clicking on the wrong file (laughs) so that you know these people had had not slept much uh in the weeks leading up to the flyby so that's kind of understandable and then then when he he did open the right file he couldn't find the right uh the right image and so he had to go down to the to the people who actually uh were monitoring the data coming back from the spacecraft and and, to, and so together, it was supposed to be just him seeing it, and then he wasn't supposed to share it with anybody in, or else in the world. But so it was kind of a group of them that got to open the image file. And he said their, their jaws just dropped to the floor. They couldn't believe what they were seeing of this just beautiful planet, of Pluto, and this uh, heart-shaped region there. And, you know... Um, a few expletives leaked out of their <laughs> of their mouths and stuff, and uh, there wasn't a, a, actually a reporter there who heard all that and and, and uh, published that later. But uh, anyway, that was kind of a fun story to to hear about because I just remember so vividly of seeing that picture myself for the first time. Other things that uh, I thought were really interesting were, you know, Matt, we've done a lot of stories from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the the incredible camera on board that mission is the high rise camera, the high resolution science experiment. And uh, so I got to the talk to the people who, who uh, program the codes to tell the spacecraft what to take a picture of. And, you know, it's, you know, just think about this spacecraft is going around at orbital speeds or uh, Mars, which is, is, I don't remember the exact uh, KPH, but, um, it goes around at incredible speeds. It's about, you know, 300 miles up, two, two to 300 miles up. And it's able to take these incredible crisp images of the surface down to a resolution of about a meter. And so it takes images in long strips, and uh, but still they can focus down on, on small details. And, you know, how do you get a spacecraft to do that? you know, from, from distances uh, from Earth to Mars. It's, it's really an incredible process. Uh, and uh, I was really happy to tell the story about uh, the people who do all this kind of behind-the-scenes work that doesn't, you know, doesn't get covered normally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, you got, to, you got to meet Alan Stern I, uh, in the course of... Uh, looking uh, gathering stories about the new horizons mission and so forth yes yeah yeah now, so yeah he's for, he's uh he's a he's a ball of fire <laughs> yeah 
Well, if, yeah, for those uh, listeners who are unfamiliar, yeah, Alan Stern was the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission, and he's become a bit of a, a subject of some controversy because, of course, as this mission was happening, there was the uh, Great Planet debate, and uh, a focal point of that debate was, is Pluto a planet or something else? And yes, and he was not too happy with uh, the International Astronomical Union's decision. Uh, that was 2006, was it? Yes, that? yes, yes that, it was right, right, right after New launched. Horizon. Yes, yeah. right after New Horizons launched, the, the IAU met and uh, decided to reclassify pluto and so yeah that mm -hmm. not that it changed the new horizons mission at all but um mm -hmm. i i you know it may have changed people's concept of it or, or whatever but um yeah he's alan stern has been very vociferous about his support of pluto is still being a planet mm -hmm. um which you know it's completely understandable and now especially since we've received those incredible images of pluto um you know just that Pluto has an atmosphere. We see Pluto might have clouds. There's mountains, there's plains, there's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just an incredible, um, incredible, I'll, I'll call it a planet. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just that it's, it's different from all the rest of, of the planets. So, you know, mm -hmm. I can see, I can see both uh, viewpoints and, I, I really don't have a strong opinion one way or other. Pluto really doesn't care what we call it. And <laughs> yeah. uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so well, you I, know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of just semantics. And uh, that's, you know, I, I enjoy reporting on, on the science of it. Mm -hmm. that, exactly. I totally agree. I was, I was actually going to say that. It's, it's just, it seems like semantics. Uh, but yeah, I, I know for uh, from personal experience that uh, that Alan Stern and uh, a lot of other research scientists and uh, and amateur astronomers they they really cared about that renaming, reclassifying because of course it they were concerned that this would diminish Pluto and the exploration thereof, which I I, I would def definitely uh, wish I could convey to them that no, no, you know. Nobody thinks that, or I don't know, maybe some people do, but who cares what they think, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now, what I was especially uh, interested in, one of the reasons why I bring up Alan Stern there was because um, both he and Mike Brown uh, had high praise for your book. And I thought, well, that's real interesting because, I mean, these men are kind of on opposite sides of the debate, kind of, I don't want to use the term enemies, but uh, yeah, they're pretty opposite each other and it's it's very impressive when you can get two people who agree on really don't agree on you know something rather famously but they both agree this book is great yeah well, thanks yeah. i hadn't really thought of that before but oh, yeah. yeah mike mike brown's book is how i killed pluto and why it had it coming and yeah. uh so that that gives you an indication of his his thoughts on the on the on the debate but uh, anyway yeah okay yeah. thanks i hadn't hadn't really thought yeah. of that before <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the um and another thing uh that came through to me with with that book there is that uh today there are a lot of exciting opportunities right there's uh there are chances to connect with space agencies and uh research institutes uh like never before thanks to you know global uh digital media, internet, et cetera, and also for citizen scientists to participate in these projects like never yes. before. So, I just saw a new one just came out this week. It's uh, using citizen scientists to look for clouds on Mars, you know, using the high-rise images and, and data. So, yeah, there's all sorts of things for people to play around with and, and may actually make a scientific contribution to some of these missions. Yeah, there's the the Zooniverse, uh, all the the Galaxy Zoo, and everything that they do. And of course, Dr. Pamela Gay has CosmoQuest, where there is just all sorts of uh, opportunities for with different missions to look. Uh, I know there used to be craters on the Moon and Mars, and uh, I'd have to look what she's got currently. But uh, yeah, there's always great things at CosmoQuest as well. And I mean, this uh, uh, one 
one very visible way that the like the citizen scientists, you know, the the new opportunities for that, which you mentioned in your book, was with Kepler. Because um, yes. yeah, so he, the Kepler Space Telescope launched in two thousand and nine, and this coincided with uh, you know, the uh, a big explosion in the use of the internet, of social media, through these new means of communicating. Citizen scientists were able to take part in the mission and, and help look for exoplanets. To, yeah. Yeah. I, I always thought that was very interesting, right? It's like somebody has got to look through the volumes of data. So it's perfect. See, it's like, yeah, source that out. If you're qualified, you can do this, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's, so that's, that's the great thing about citizen scientists science mm-hmm. is that you can, you can do things to really help out the scientists from the mission because there's reams of data that, that come in from these spacecraft. And so there's just no way humanly possible that a science team can look at everything and Mm -hmm. kind of eke out the interesting little tidbits. Whereas when you've got thousands of, of eyes other than your science team looking at it and saying, Hey, this looks interesting or this looks interesting, you know, and then, you know, there's also computer ways that they, you can train computers to kind of, find the interesting bits in the data as well. So yeah, it's, it, it's kind of a great synergy between the public, the scientists, and, and also uh, the advancement in computer recognition of these kind of types of data. Okay, so last thing I want to say about uh, Incredible Stories from Space, because we, we got to get to eight years to the moon here. So you mentioned um, at the end of, uh, of your book there, missions to be on the lookout for, many of which have taken to space and uh, gone to Mars or uh, since. And now I, I, I definitely was anticipating that uh, certain missions that you mentioned, I was definitely anticipating those. Uh, some other ones I thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> forgot about those guys. Th- thank you for reminding me. They, they have shown us a lot. But I wanted to ask your personal opinion of all the missions that were yet to come in 2016. And, you know, we can extend that to today. 2022, the missions we're looking forward to. What would you say are like the top two or three missions that you're most excited to see? Well, I have to say the James Webb Space Telescope because uh, in in two weeks from when we're recording this, Matt, uh, the, the mission, the, the first images from the mission should be released. And so that's you know, I'm really anticipating what those images will reveal, just how how much they'll differ from Hubble or Spitzer previous telescopes. And yeah, it's been a long time coming for James Webb. So that's that's pretty interesting. And, you know, it's it's garnered a lot of attention just because of how complicated the mission was, uh, the launch, the the unfolding of the telescope on its way out to L2, Lagrange Point 2. Um, about a million miles from Earth, and just everything has gone incredibly well, just almost perfectly. So um, even after you know decades of delays and funding issues and more delays, it's it's finally coming to fruition. And so I think everybody's pretty excited about James Webb. Oh, the Os- oh, Os- Osiris Rex mission to asteroid Bennu that that has launched now and actually. Uh, is on its way back, bringing a sample from from the asteroid. So that's that's really exciting, and just how well that mission went, went as well. You know, trying to bring the spacecraft down close enough so it could nab uh, some some regolith and some rocks maybe from the from the asteroid. And yeah, that's that was really exciting to watch and see that happen in real time. And uh, so that was a fun mission to to look for to. To experience and and to be able to write about it as well. Let's see. Yeah, I was I was definitely betting on you saying James Webb. I wish I'd I wish I'd put some money down with that on that. There. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, and yes. the other the other mission that was just about to launch as I actually it launched before the book was published, but of course I had to do the interviews months earlier before for the book. Uh, the Juno mission to Jupiter, and that's been just uh, really fun. Uh, of course. The images that we see from the public or are, are, are that the public sees is from a camera that originally was not going to be on the spacecraft because uh, the spacecraft is all about studying Jupiter and its magnetosphere. And so there's all sorts of 
magnetometers and spectrometers and things like that on the on the spacecraft, but they realized, oh, we should actually, you know, we're going to this beautiful planet, we should bring a camera along. And so it's been basically a citizen science based camera where the members of the public get to choose what it takes pictures of. Members of the public are processing the images and the data when it comes back. So that's that's really been fun. And uh, of course, we're learning more about Jupiter all the time because of this mission. And it's and it's ongoing. Like a lot of the missions these days, it had a specific light t- lifetime for its prime mission. And the mission is lasting much longer. And the spacecraft and the hardware is performing magnificently. So They've been able to extend the mission and it's still ongoing where originally it was going to be over with by, I think, 2018 or 19. The images that it sent back, they are breathtaking. Yes, they really are. Yes. If you haven't, uh, if uh, any listeners haven't uh, checked those out, I mean, I, I would say you have already seen them. You may not have known they were coming from Juno, but yes, it makes, uh, makes Jupiter's atmosphere looks uh, like a, Milk entering coffee, <laughs> just <laughs> yes. slowly percolating, That's... or yeah, or the the perfect pour of a Guinness or equally uh, frothy beer, right? It's yeah, beautiful. That's a yeah. good. That's a good description. Yeah, <laughs> You're making me looks... thirsty here, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, it's still. It's not even. It's not eleven yet, so we'll stick with coffee, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, so um, as for Eight Years to the Moon, this was released in 2019. It was re-released, a special edition for the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo 11. And here, too, your your purpose was was very clearly similar, right? It was, uh, it was telling the human stories behind the, the the headlines. But, of course, this time around, there, there, there was very much a human face on the program, but it was... It was that of Kennedy. It was that of the astronauts themselves. A little excerpt here from the uh, from your book. You said that uh, while there were three people on the moon, it took over 400,000 people working back on Earth there to make this happen. And they were all there, too, for that triumphant moment where Armstrong is stepping off the lander and... And, he, yes, even in, included the bit about uh, when uh, they were told all these smiling faces down here and Armstrong said, well, there's two up here too. And Michael Collins chimed in <laughs> up in the, uh, yeah. Uh, command and service module and said, uh, that's three. Thank you. Three people. <laughs> and yes. again, I thought, and I thought eh, he's right. I mean, uh, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong became household names. How many of us really know about who was piloting the whole time there? That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And so that, uh, really struck me as very, very interesting there. And um, to give our listeners an example, you you were telling the story about how in 1962, when Kennedy came to visit the Manned Spacecraft Center, there's the apocryphal story about how he said hello to a janitor and the janitor said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon when he was asked, what do you do around here? And of course, yeah, and, and Kennedy laughed because yes, that's absolutely true. Everybody here, there's no nobody's doing anything less than contributing to this program its lofty goals but that that this didn't really happen it's one of those uh like legends yeah. that sort of are, it, right, it makes a right. point it makes a valid point but it didn't actually take place and yeah but was something but something that did take place um and i really enjoyed reading about this so a spacesuit engineer named joe cosmo was called in to demonstrate the spacesuits to Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Werner von Braun was there and all these big wigs and higher ups. And uh, Johnson threw a quarter on the ground and he said, Oh, look, he'll, he'll even be able to pick it up. And he's all nervous. Cause he's like, we didn't practice this. <laughs> he's like, don't improvise. Come on. <laughs> but he managed to do that. And then shortly thereafter, they're, they're looking in the, um, in a, a mock-up of the lunar module and yeah. uh, von Braun falls and lands on on uh, Joe Cosmo, and thanks him for saving his life. And it's like, wow! So so this guy, who felt totally out of place, he was brought in, and he ends up saving their chief rocket engineer and all that stuff. But nobody hears about it because shortly thereafter, Kennedy goes over to Rice University, which is right nearby, and uh, gives his famous speech. 
Right. And yeah, when, and <laughs> yeah, I thought that is so typical. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and who has not heard that speech? But yeah, it's like something really, really major happened behind the scenes that was probably a lot more important than Kennedy's speaking engagement. But history remembers this. Yeah. Who, who, well, that, what yeah. would have happened if Ferner von Braun had had uh, been seriously injured or passed away that day from that fall? That's that's mm-hmm. pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. When when my when my publisher asked me to write a book about the Apollo program because we were discussing what you know they said that they'd like to do another book with me and discussing what we should do and I kind of happened to mention, mention that the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 was coming up in uh, a couple of years. And uh, they said, oh, that's that's definitely what we want you to write about. And so uh, you know, I started doing a little research and found that there are already hundreds of books on Apollo. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I had to do something different. And uh, kind of going back to what I did in my first book was telling the stories of, of people you don't normally hear about. And so I just thought, well, I'm going to take the same approach here and talk to people who, as one of the... The gentleman that I interviewed told me, he said, you know, besides my friends and family, nobody else has really ever asked me about what I did on Apollo. And here's a guy that made incredible contributions. Uh, There was some thrusters on the command module. They were under development and they kept blowing up and nobody could figure out why they were blowing up. And of course, something blowing up on the way to the moon is not a good thing. And uh, he's one of the guys who helped figure out, wh- you know, what was happening and, and got that got that fixed. So, um, you know, he made pretty monumental contributions to the Apollo program. You know, if, if these if these thrusters had, had continued to to malfunction, you know, they would not have made it to the moon before 1970. So that's mm-hmm. that was a big contribution. So, yeah, uh, I, I feel really honored. I, I interviewed about 45 different engineers. I knew I couldn't tell the story of all 400,000 people, but uh, I interviewed about 45 people and got their behind the scenes stories. Um, kind of one one that really stands out is a, a story that has not been written about before, and it took a lot of people off uh, off guard, is that when Apollo 11 was coming back home and returning to Earth, uh, the command module was it was se- would separate from the service module, and the service module was supposed to go off and re-enter at another time. Well, what actually happened, and uh, they found this had happened on Apollo Eight as well, coming back from the moon, was that the, the thruster firings on the service module didn't work as they exactly intended, and so the the crew of Apollo 11 saw the service module flying over them and going in and, uh, you know, going down to Earth's atmosphere and and burning up ahead of them. That was not the plan. (laughs) And so, uh, so they, uh, this got realized after they came back home and, uh, you know, it wasn't really discussed as being an issue during the mission, it was after the mission that they realized that this was not the way this was supposed to work um, because, you know, pieces coming off as, as it broke up in the atmosphere could have struck the command module and that would have, that would have been curtains basically. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they had to fix that. And uh, it, it wasn't something that was well known or, or talked about. And in fact, some of the guys in mission control, when they read what I had written, they said, uh, they got in touch with me and said, you need to, write a retraction. This this did not happen. And I said, well, I, I've got the uh, documentation here. I've got the engineer uh, who who fixed it. Let's let's have you talk to him. Uh, so it was it was kind of a, a I don't know, a major reveal in my book or, or whatever you yeah. want to call it. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so I was privileged to be able to tell those kind of stories of of things that other people hadn't heard about before. Yeah. Well, I remember, yeah, I remember when the book was released, uh, uh, hearing you talk about that, <laughs> this whole process, they're revealing these untold stories. And and yes, especially about how NASA was kind of <laughs> pounced there, right? And said, uh, whoa, 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 can she say this? 
Has this been declassified? <laughs> Has this been declassified yet? Like, oh, I don't know. Nobody remembers. <laughs> Everyone just remembers the the mission. Yeah, but yeah. Well, that's that's like, kind of the thing. They were so all the engineers and were so busy trying to get rest ready for the next mission that if if you weren't specifically working on the thrusters for the service module, you didn't have time to think about that. You were wor- worried about your own systems or or components that you were working on and you you were relying on everybody else to make sure that their the things that they were working on were working properly so uh you know it was it was it was bang bang you know how quickly the missions you know, we we think when uh when you know the space shuttle used to have about two missions a year at 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 top uh top speed that was that was big but um you know the the apollo missions were coming quite quickly run one right after another so yeah. it was a it was a busy time for them i, I wrote mm-hmm. a lot about how they um they missed a lot of family things they missed their seeing their kids uh, grow up you know first first dances for their for their daughters or you know uh, ball games for their for their sons and a lot of marriages suffered because of mm-hmm. how much time these people were dedicating to to the Apollo missions. So it was a uh, it, it took a toll on on a lot of lives and marriages. And uh, but it was obviously for these people who worked on it, it is one of the most major accomplishments of their lives, and they're extremely mm-hmm. proud of it. Yeah. And of course, yeah, it's like it's not just the astronauts who had all kinds of family issues and drama going on there, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. It's like yeah, kids, uh, parents are escorting to school. You know, it's like, well, yes. Well, where's your dad? Why can couldn't he make it? He's on the moon. I'm like, oh right, right. You're so and so. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's like, well, uh, my dad and my mom uh, are yeah specialists over at JPL at NASA. They're helping put those guys up there, right? You know about the yeah. astronauts. Well, my yeah, my parents are the ones helping make that happen. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's oh yeah, that is uh, I think a very important reminder. So I think it's very good that uh, well, your 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 publisher uh, encouraged you to keep writing. Um, yeah, do you do you foresee uh, like another book uh, of this nature in, in the future? Not right now. Um, mm-hmm. It's, uh, I think, you know, with uh, that last book, it took a, a, a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, I, too, kind of had to neglect my family for a little while <laughs> in writing oh, that yeah. book. Yes. And, oh. uh, and so I've, uh, and and just what's happened with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and everything, it's just, uh you know, you, you kind of focus on on the things that are really important. And um, yeah, I don't see that happening in right right away in the near future anyway, but who knows, You like like we discussed mm-hmm. earlier, you never know how your life is going to turn out and what opportunities present themselves. So yeah, yeah. I, I guess yeah. I'm always open to, to something ha- like that happening, but don't see it right now. Mm-hmm. Well, I, could, I, I kind of feel like uh, I must sound like your publisher right now. Because, uh, you know, if I were your publisher, I'd be saying, you know, let's, uh, how about the space shuttle next? How about the ISS next? So many stories, you know. There never, really never, are. Yeah. yeah. There, and, and there not, really are lots that. of stories out there. So anybody yeah. looking uh, to to write a book about space, there are there are tons of stories out there that haven't been told. So go look for yeah. them. Well, yeah, that's a wonderful and encouraging note there to, uh, <laughs> to uh, offer the listeners here. Um, and yeah, I'd point out that uh, Nancy and I, uh, like I said, she's a colleague. She pretty much helped you, you. You helped get my feet wet over at Universe Today, right? When I joined in 2014, you were you were the editor. Yeah, senior editor at that time. So yeah, I've, I've since you know when I started writing the books, I, I stepped back a little bit. So now I'm considered a contributing editor, but um, that's been one of the really fun parts of working for universe today is working with a lot of the different writers and helping, uh, you know, kind of being a mentor to the, to the new writers, the young writers, just to give them a sense of, of writing online. It's a little bit different than writing for a magazine. You've kind of got to state your, your, uh, 
premise right or right up front and you've got to have a great headline which fraser usually takes care of and does a great job on and okay. uh, you know you got to have a the great opening paragraph that grabs you and tells the readers why you should keep reading you know it's it's easy to just scroll through or go on to the next story but if you've got something that really grabs you uh you're going to make the readers stick with it so that's uh kind of one of the things that i uh really focused on in, in helping some of the new writers. And thank you for that, because that, that was uh, very helpful. You, you walked me through uh, several mistakes that I made and how not to repeat them. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, Fraser, Fraser had to do that, too. There, uh, I, I do tend to uh, make mistakes more than once. The same mistakes. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it was it was very helpful. And yeah, it was very educational. I, I, I do. I do kind of miss the days of, you know, when there was that big old learning curve. Um, and well, there's uh, not, well, yeah, there's nothing like, uh, you know, learning on the job and, and, and learning from experience. And of course, by 2014, I had had several years of experience of writing for, for universe today. And, but it's, it's great to be able to share that experience and share what I've learned too. And mm -hmm. so I said that, as I said, that was, that's been a really fun part of, of being a writer is just being able to mentor younger writers as well. Uh, so to uh, our listeners, I, I recommend very much that you check out Nancy's uh, articles there on University of Age, where she is a regular contributor and her experience and seniority are, are pretty evident in, in the stories that, uh, that you cover. I would say there's always, uh, you're always covering really cool stuff. And uh, yes. And also, uh, at the uh, Planetary Society and at the uh, National Space Society's publication at Astra. Um, and your most recent, could you remind me again? Yes. Supercluster. Supercluster. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And also, uh, yes, if you haven't checked out these books, I, I strongly advise you to because they are really wonderful and informative reads. They talk about something which many people will find intimidating or just uh, overwhelming, space science and, and research, but in an accessible way and also in a personalized way. Well, thank it, you, a, Matt. So thank you so much for coming in today, uh, Nancy. Uh, hope to have you back. I hope there's uh, some uh, big news for you in the near future. Like, uh, well, if not another book, then something equally, how about a lecture series? <laughs> Maybe. Then again, maybe you could maybe you could uh, launch a podcast here. Right? Oh my gosh! Well, that that's definitely not on my radar. But uh, like, mm -hmm. as I said, you never know what what happens. Exactly, you'll you'll find you'll find it there. And so, yeah. In any case, I hope we can have you back. To all our listeners, thanks for tuning in. I'm Matt Williams, and this has been Stories from Space. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stories from Space podcast with Matthew Williams. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.